Welcome to the Gamescape, everybody. My name is Jarek, and today we're back in Phoenix Point. This is the sixth installment of our Know Your Enemy series, and as you can see on the screen today, we are going to be looking at the Scylla, the queens of the Pandorans, and these things are nasty. Uh, there's a lot to say about these guys, so we're going to dive right into it. There's 10 different types, uh, as you can see here, kind of take a look across them, and they all have similar body parts. There are a few differences that we're going to start out talking about. The first thing that we're going to look at is they have three different heads, and these first three actually have the three different heads. You got the Xenagos here that has the Fury head, and the ability that goes along with that is Instill Frenzy. So this guy has the, yep, right here, Instill Frenzy. Uh, every every ally within 20 tiles gets uh, their speed increased by 50% for two turns and makes them immune to panic. The second head is the Goose Bitter head. So if we take a look at this one, uh, it has the ability to uh, spit goo here. Uh, spits poisonous goo in a narrow cone area. So uh, that's a blast of 30 damage, which isn't much. And then it does goo, and then it also does poison if the blast penetrates. Uh, so that's that's a thing. We can take a look at that and kind of see. Uh, I've, I've spawned these guys in as my own units. So we have actually have control of these guys. So we can see uh, it's not a huge area, but it's it's about a three tile blast area. And it's got an OK range. Um, it's it's a we, we can just actually do this real quick. Let's just see what happens here. Okay, so you can see it actually puts out a pretty big goose like there if you uh, if you get it spread out. So that's not uh, that's not too bad. Uh, you're going to want to avoid that if you can. But it's a fairly narrow cone at least. So if you uh, kind of mind your spacing side to side against these guys, it's not too bad. And that's about the extent of its range there too. So that's not terrible. If you get stuck in that though, you're going to get poisoned and you're going to be stuck there for about five turns. Uh, while it's uh, evaporating off. So that's not a great place to be against these guys, probably. The uh, third one here has the Sonic Head. And this one has the Sonic Blast. Emits a Sonic Blast in a cone area that da dazes the target if the blast value is greater than the target's will points. Um, this one's problematic because the Sonic damage on this is 30. Your soldiers don't have 30 will points. There is one case if you have a priest and he has the judgment head and he has either the farsighted or the healer trait, you can get him up to 30 will points, uh, 32 if he has both. But even then, that's assuming you haven't spent any will points. So he, pretty much silo wins, you lose. Uh, as far as this sonic head is concerned and you're going to get dazed in a cone now you can see here again pretty long distance on that cone uh and it's uh probably three four five tiles wide at its at its apex there so against these guys you kind of want to mind your your horizontal spacing and make sure that you have some don't bunch your guys up into groups like this because you're going to have a bad day if you do so that's the different heads uh, you'll also notice they have uh, probably two different kinds of arms here. You might have noticed the, the first ones uh, are the ones you've probably already seen if you've gone against these guys. They're the smasher arms and they're melee attacks. So let's take a look at those. This follows the same pattern that we've seen across a lot of the other Pandorans where it's got actually three weapons here. Uh, one of them is is two handed. That's this one. And it's just, you know, the damage and the shred with a burst of two that just represents the uh, Scylla having both of its arms still intact. If it can, it'll use this one. If it only has one arm left, it'll use one of these other two, which are the same thing, but it doesn't have the burst. Um, so a couple things to notice here. Uh, the uh, action points for this thing are just one. So even if you war cry this thing, it can still move and still hit you with it. Now, fortunately, it can only use this once per turn because it does a lot of damage. It's 100 damage and 30 shred uh, with both our, both claws acting. That's 200 damage and 60 shred to your to your soldier that he hits or whatever else he's hitting. So that's a lot of damage. Fortunately, it's a one one use per turn ability. He can't just keep hacking at you as long as he's got will uh, action points left. So that's you know at least a small blessing on that. 
still something to be very concerned about. Um, and these guys are pretty quick too. We'll get to that in just a second here. Uh, the second set of arms are these blaster arms. And so it's kind of the same idea, except these things are even worse. So this thing fires off bursts of explosives. Uh, you can see here blast damage is 80 with 30 shred. Um, and the burst is 10. That's for the single one. This is the double one. It's a burst of 20. Effective range is 30. Action points to use is 2. The only good thing about this is he does have to prepare it to fire. And so I'll, I'll show you real quick how that works too. So let's let's get that selected here. Um, let's get make sure we have the right one. This is the 80 times 20 rounds. And what we're going to do is we do the prepare cannons now you can see that this is a uh, a cone as well, and it's comes out to roughly here, but you're gonna see that it gets a lot worse than this because it's uh, we're gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, so he's preparing now. All right, and so at the beginning of his next turn, he will actually do that shot. Now you'll notice the arms point to where the cone is is firing. Right. So if I were to do let's let's push this. Uh, well, let's just do this this way. We'll have two of them shoot and it'll be spectacular. Oh, that was the side. That was the head. Sorry. We want the blaster arms. Okay. Okay, so if we prepare and we kind of shoot across diagonally like this, you can see his arms are pointed where they're going to fire. Okay. And so you can use that if you're close enough you can get out of that arc of fire by moving towards him and diagonally against, right? So if you had a soldier here, you'd want to move this way or this way to get out of that cone. Don't try to go backward, obviously. That's going to be worse. And side to side, uh, you know, get get out of the center of that, that line there, and you should be okay. Unfortunately, if he's a long way away from you and he starts this, you might not have the option. In that case, you want to look for a building or a wall to hide behind to see if you can avoid some of that damage. So just to uh, kind of let you see what happens with these, I'm going to zoom out. And we're going to zoom out further. And I'm going to see the end the turn and let it go to the next turn. Watch this. So you can see it spreads out in a big area. Blew up some of the goo. <laughs> All right. So that was actually both of them shooting. Uh, it didn't show the animation for the second one. But you can see big area. Uh, you don't want to be in front of that. That's going to be bad for you. I do recommend always having blast vests on your soldiers if you can, uh, if they're not using any other torso mount. The the blast vest, and this is not just against the silos, this is just in general. The blast vest reduces the blast damage that you take by 50%. And where you run into trouble with blast damage is when you start losing arms and legs. And so if you if you're having that damage that that goes a long way towards keeping your keeping your limbs intact a lot longer against a lot more blasts so i i super recommend those blast vests once you have access to them and you've researched the technology they can really save your soldier all right so that's the two different types of arms uh there's two different abdomens the the one here that looks like a circle or like a snail is the spawning abdomen and that one allows the Scylla to hatch a mind fragger it costs no action points but it is four will points to do it so they can and i believe they can they can only do that once per turn as well uh there's not a you know you can't just keep dumping will points into spawning more and more mind fraggers it's a once per turn thing the other one is this uh kind of more aquatic looking one that's kind of sticking way up in the air like that and what happens with that one is when the Scylla dies, this thing bursts open and several mind fraggers will spawn from it. So that's uh, something that you're going to want to be mindful of. If you see this particular abdomen on any of these guys, you're going to want to be ready to deal with, with mind fraggers when it goes down because they're going to come right after you most likely. Okay. Then we have three different carapaces. Uh, this one here on the Xenagos and, you know, this this kind of, I don't know, branchy looking one. Uh, that's the Misty Mitter. 
that that lets the Scylla spawn mist, and it'll spawn mist when it takes a hit. This one here, that's got the kind of little projectors on it or whatever, this is the mist launcher, okay? This one can actually fire mist as a projectile, right? So he can take this and he can launch a mist bomb just like that. And it's going to create a big mist cloud right here. Pretty good sized one too, right? I mean, it's not enormous. It's it's probably eight across there, eight or ten. So decent sized mist cloud that can get your soldiers in a spot to where they're going to start their turn in the cloud and therefore lose a couple of, of will points. And then the third one is just this big, big one here. It doesn't have any abilities, but it has a lot of armor. It's 80 armor and it's six, 600 health to break this. So this one really is just to protect the abdomen, which on all of these things is really its weakest point. Uh, the abdomens, both of them only have 30 armor. That's its lightest armor. Even the legs have more than that. So that's going to be something that we're going to look at here in just a second. Those are its attacks. Those are its different body parts, right? And so if we take a, a little bit closer look at this thing, we can really get into it. Uh, 3,900, uh, the hit points on these things. Uh, the range on these actually varies pretty decently. 3,200 is the weakest one. 4,800 is the strongest. Will points, they vary also from 42 up to 66. Movement varies from 22 up to 30, depending on which one you're looking at. So these guys have a lot of will points. They have a ton of hit points. They're bullet sponges, but they've got armor to back that up too. We'll check that in a second. And they're fast, right? I mean, the slowest one is 22. That's that's faster than most of your soldiers are going to be. And so they can cover a lot of distance across the map. Uh, last body part, while we're still talking about these guys, is the legs. Uh, there's two different types of legs too. These in the front here, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so we get a little bit better view. So they're all kind of skinny, uh, but these ones are the agile legs, right? And they're just come down to a real point at the bottom. The agile legs give the Scylla the monster leap ability, which is three action points and two will points allows them to leap up to 10 tiles and it basically smashes everything in their path. These are a little bit thicker and they have these kind of barbed uh, chitin spears on the end of them. These are the heavy legs. They don't provide any abilities. They're just legs. So uh, that's kind of, they're, they're heavier legs though. They have more armor, more hit points. So we can take a look at that too in just a minute too. But let's take a look at this guy. So he's got the, he's got the agile legs, 600 health, 40 armor on each one. He's got six of them. Each one of these legs that you take out reduces his, his speed, of course, and all of his speed. I don't know if this is true across all of them. I think a couple of them might have a couple of movement points left after you take out all of their legs, but most of them are going to be stuck where they are if you take out most of the take out all of their legs. So all of their all of their movement points are tied up to their legs. Now, obviously, that's a trick. You know, you're going to want area of effect attacks to be doing that kind of stuff. Fire is pretty good for that. We'll talk about tips and tricks and stuff like that here in a little bit after we take a, a look at these guys. So, but anyway, legs, agile legs are 640 uh, armor. The heavy legs, if we take a look at this one, the heavy legs are 800 with 60 armor. So they're quite a bit tougher, a lot more armor to deal with. So pretty good, pretty heavy, but no extra abilities on those heavy legs at least. So that's good. Ah, uh, what else do we got? Spawn mist. This is uh, one we already talked about. This virus resistance here is uh, a little bit of a weird artifact of these guys having spawned in on, on my team instead of the aliens team. So these guys are all listed out as this front row having virus resist. That's incorrect. They don't actually have it. And if you have an alien Xenagos or, you know, an alien Nocturna or whatever, they will not. The ones in the back, the Thyreos, the Imperator, Hegemon and the Regina and the Smaragdus, they all actually do have virus resistance. So they take half virus damage. It's not listed here, but it is there on the alien ones. So that's something to kind of be aware of. That's like I said, that's just a weird artifact of these guys being spawned in on my team rather than the alien team. I don't know why it did that, but I just wanted to point that out. And I was scratching my head on that one for just a little while while I was setting this up. It's like, well, I've never seen that before, but 
yeah, I, I just checked it out and they're not actually virus resistant, the, the front row ones, but the back ones are. So we'll talk about virus damage in a minute too, because you're going to want to know about that. All right. Carapace. Uh, these vary depending on which carapace it has, but they're all heavily armored. Uh, head always pretty heavily armored. Also varies hit points and armor depending on which head it is. Arms, again, same thing. The blasters aren't as heavily armored. <laughs> one little slightly odd thing is one arm always has one more health than the other one. I don't know why that is, but it does. Just a little bit weird. Uh, then the uh, the legs we talked about, the abdomen, again, depending on uh, which one it is. Both of them have 30 armor. I don't know if they both have 2,400 health, though. Let's check that real quick. So the abdomen here, yeah, they're both 2,400 health with 30 armor. So they're pretty pretty even. They just have different abilities. So that's kind of a look at them. Um, like I said, three heads, two different sets of legs, two different sets of arms, two different abdomens, and two three different carapaces so and then then there's the smaragdus which we are going to take a look at too because he's got some special stuff so this death belch ability is just his carapace you know putting out a whole bunch of mind fraggers when he dies but this guy has the living crystal supercharge now what this is is every single hit that this guy takes and that's every bullet from a burst that's everything Every hit gives him a stack of this Living Crystal Supercharge, and each stack then adds 5% damage to his next attack. With the amount of hit points and health and armor and everything that these guys have, that's going to be a lot. So you're going to want to be super careful of that if you ever find one of these in-game, because he's gonna, you're going to stack a whole bunch of this Living Crystal Supercharge up on him, and then he's just going to maul something. Uh, he's got the Sonic Blast, he's got the Monster Leap, and he can do the cannon thing. Uh, extra extra damage on these cannon blasts, it's it's just vicious. And you're not gonna be want to part you're not gonna want to be a part of that for sure. And it's any next attack, right? So it doesn't matter which one. Uh, probably it's gonna be the the prepare cannons because that's pretty much his only attack. It could be the Sonic Blast, I suppose. If that's the case, okay, you're all right. You're going to you're gonna lose to that Sonic Blast no matter what. It doesn't really matter too much if it's doing a little bit of extra damage to you. So that's all right. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of show you him too. He's actually the weakest hit point-wise of all of them at 3,200. Uh, he's got good will and fast speed, though. He's really quick at 30. So And he's got really strong armor on his carapace. Look at this. He's got 80 armor on that carapace. Uh, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40s across the board here for pretty much everything. 50 on the torso and 30 on the abdomen. So that's really thick armor. It's not the thickest except for 80 is the highest of any of them. But all of these others have 80 on their, uh, these heavy, these heavy carapaces are also 80. He's got 60 on his legs. He's got 30, uh, 50, you know, so it's, they're pretty, pretty nasty. All of them have the same torso, by the way. There's no difference in the torsos, same stats on all of those. All right, so that's the stats. That's some of how they can attack. What are some of their other strengths? Well, I mean, the obvious high, high health and high armor. Like I said, 30 is the lightest armor on any of these things on their on their abdomens. From there, it just gets worse and worse. All of them are fast, some faster than others, but all of them have high, what I would consider to be high speed. Um, they do a lot of damage with their attacks. And we kind of saw that, you know, 200 if he hit 200 damage and 60 shred if he hits you with both of his smashers the cannons 20 blast projectiles fired out that are each doing 80 damage 30 shred uh just just ridiculous amounts of damage if you get caught in it potentially other than that though and some of their other abilities like i said that sonic blast you're just gonna lose to that you you just lose unless you have the edge case priest with all the right stuff uh, you're going to be dazed and there's nothing you can really do about it. So just be prepared for that and try not to let him hit more than one of your guys with that cone. And then the uh, the goo, we talked about the goo already too. Uh, it's going to immobilize your guys, so be careful. Again, keep your horizontal spacing pretty decent against these guys if you can, if they've got either of those two abilities, because at least you won't be in that cone with more than one or two of your guys. Um, spawning Mindfraggers is an annoyance probably more than anything else, as long as you have help nearby to get the Mindfragger off the guy's head that actually it lands on. So there's that. 
the the thing you do have to be a little bit careful of is if these guys are away from your soldiers and they have a couple of turns to push more than one mind fragger out and then they frenzy them right so frenzied mind fraggers are quite fast they can move a long way and still ca catch your guys and if there's a couple of them, you you might have a little bit of trouble with that. So just a little something to be a little bit aware of. Um, make sure you have some okay overwatches. Maybe if you know that he's pushing out a bunch of mind fraggers, then they're going to be coming to you. That's something else. Probably not a big deal, though. Uh, you, you, you might run into that, but it's manageable. So what are the weaknesses on these guys? Do they have any weaknesses? Well, fortunately, yes, they have weaknesses. Uh, the number one thing that you're going to want to deal with these guys is virus damage. And even with the back row guys being resistant to virus, you're going to be able to get them down from their high will points down to zero and get them into a panic cascade a lot faster than you're going to be able to deal with them in any other other way. Just with the number of hit points that they have, you know, killing them is a, cho is a task for the whole team that's going to take a few turns. And capturing them which we will talk about too uh, you're you're looking at 390 paralyzation damage for this guy same here uh four, 400 for this guy and so on so they're hard to paralyze too especially you know doing only seven damage or 15 or eight or damage at a time with most of the paralyzation weapons it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a long road to hoe so to speak so getting these guys to panic cascade is going to be the absolute best way to deal with them. They are somewhat susceptible to Warcry. Not super susceptible, but a little bit. What you can do against these guys with Warcry is you can stop them from leaping, which is good if you have them in a fire patch, right? If you can get some fire down around these guys and get them burning and then allow not allow them to leap away, then they're going to have to move through the fire. And that's just extra damage that you're going to get for free. And it's more burning that's going to get to applied to them. And that can stack up fairly quickly on these guys and, and do a decent amount of damage to them. So the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to make the Sila kind of choose what it's doing, which isn't the best thing. But for the most part, a lot of these guys you're going to want to be semi close to anyway so you might as well hit them with the war cry get them down to 2 ap instead of 4 at least you know make them make them make some decisions at least it's not the best thing but it's something that you've got in your in your pocket uh their legs who already talked about their legs a little bit but all of their movements tied up in their legs or at least almost all of their movement if you manage to disable all of their legs they're not going anywhere then they're just a sitting target for you you can move to where they can't you know hit you with their ranged attacks and and then just take them apart at your leisure another one of their weaknesses they're really big these guys are five by five tiles and so that's good for you in a cup for a couple of reasons number one and i've got a, a heavy out here to demonstrate this rage burst this is one of the very few areas where Rage Burst actually works. So I've got my heavy here. He's got a Deceptor machine gun and he is standing seven tiles away from this guy. That's 10 tiles away from his center. Okay, so he's a five by five target. I'm 10 tiles away. So if we activate Rage Burst on this guy, you want to be careful how you target it because you want to make sure that you're aiming up at the body and not down by the legs because it will pass bullets underneath if you're not careful so you want to make sure that your your cone of attack is up here on the body not down here at the legs so but if we do this let's see how well this works now we're going to be firing off five bursts of machine gun bullets at this guy and let's see how well they hit here oh, we can't see but that's a lot of hits He's bleeding. Okay, we're going to take a look and see what we did to him here. So he just took hits, so he's going to spawn mist all over the place here. See what we did. So we got his carapace down from 14, 50 down to 14. And we got his spawning abdomen from 30 down to 2. So that's actually some pretty decent concentration. Uh, we did... 300 ish damage to the carapace through all that armor and we did another what 
400 almost, a little over 400 to the spawning abdomen and chipped its armor away. So that's the problem with being big is even a trash ability like Rage Burst becomes good against you. Um, I don't normally encourage Rage Burst because it is extremely niche in where it's useful, but this is one of those cases. Now, we just burned up a full clip of Deceptor gun ammo, but that's quite a lot of damage that we just did, so it's not too bad. We did uh, not quite a quarter of his total hit points damage in that one action, so not bad, not bad. The other thing that is really good about them being big is that you can use weapons against them that you are not proficient with. And I am speaking pretty much specifically about virus rifles. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Last thing on the weaknesses, though, uh, and I've already mentioned it, is the abdomen. Go for the abdomen. It's got the lightest armor and it's got a lot of hit points that you can chew on. Uh, so once you're through that armor, you're going to be doing more health damage to it over and over and over again. So that's that's kind of it as far as its actual weaknesses. But let's go back to the virus rifles for a second, because like I said, one of your best ways to deal with these guys is to hit them up with a whole bunch of virus damage and put them into a panic cascade. Normally, just the priests can use the virus rifles, which is not right. Actually, that's that's not correct. Normally, the priest is only the one the only one proficient with virus rifles. But Firing a weapon that you're not proficient with, all it does is it reduces the effective range by half, or in, in other words, it basically makes it a lot less accurate. Against a creature this big, that isn't that big of a deal, generally speaking. You can you can still hit a target the size of that abdomen from a good amount away. I mean, you're going to need to be reasonably close to it, but it's, it's going to be hittable even if you're not proficient with the weapon. You do have to mind the armor, though, because the... Virus rifles only penetrate so much armor, and they do have to actually do at least one point of damage for them to apply the virus effect. So the uh, Redeemer, which is the virus rifle, the assault rifle, um, it's good against anything less than 30 armor. If, if it's got 30 armor, it's not going to penetrate. It's not going to do anything. 30 or more, it's no good against. So you do have to chip a little bit of armor even off of the uh, abdomen for the virus rifle to work. The virus sniper rifle is better. It's good against anything up to 70, not including 70. So if it's got 70 armor or higher, the virus rifle's not going to penetrate. You're not going to do the uh, the damage to it. But yeah, if you can start stacking up virus damage on these guys, it, it drains their willpower pretty fast. And once they're down to zero, uh, what happens is they'll panic. That takes them out for a turn. And then they'll recover for the next turn. And they'll get back half their, their will points. But then the virus damage kicks in again and brings them back down to zero again and they panic again. And so if you can start that virus cascade and you can keep enough virus damage on them, you'll immobilize them and they won't be able to do anything. They'll just stand there. And at that point, they're not a threat to you anymore. You can do what you want to them at your leisure, whether that's kill them or capture them. Second tip on these guys, be able to break armor if you're going up against one of these and you know it. Uh, first thing, like I said, if you know you're going up against one of these things, you're going into a citadel, for instance, make sure you're bringing virus rifles with you. Second thing, make sure you bring an ability to break armor. Now, that's a, that's a couple of different things, right? We just saw uh, a heavy with a deceptor and rage burst can do a decent job on the armor on these things. Uh, the other thing that's really, really good at breaking armor is a berserker with the armor break ability and grenades. Uh, now, Armor break, when it is applied to a burst weapon like a machine gun or an assault rifle, the 30 points of, of shred that it does is divided across the different bullets. That's not the true, that's not true with a grenade or other explosives. When you put armor break on something that's explosive, every body part that's hit by that explosion loses the 30 armor. So it's a really effective way to get rid of this armor in a big hurry. You know, if you can pitch one or two or three grenades in there with armor break attached to each one of them you're gonna you're gonna shred up all the armor and then it's not gonna be an issue anymore so that's my second tip for you guys make sure you a have virus rifles b you can break armor 
Third thing, fire. Fire's your friend against these guys. And with the ones with agile legs, you do have to kind of make sure that you limit their ability to leap out of the fire as well. But if you can put a big fire patch down around these guys, like I was saying earlier, that's just free damage, free burning. And every tile that they move through the fire is going to increase that for you. So that's another quick way to bring these guys down, get them bleeding really fast, and uh, just generally make your life quite a bit easier. The other thing that it does is it burns up the mind fraggers that they spawn which is another thing if you don't have to deal with those things and mind fraggers they're dumb they'll run right through the fire to get to you so it's they're they're really dumb they don't have any problem with charging into fire and committing suicide so use that to your advantage too for the blasters guys with blaster arms like i said best best bet against them get close so that you can avoid the blaster fire right once you see that they're going to shoot, just move diagonally to the side, get beside them, get behind them, whatever. These guys can't really hurt you that bad up close. Um, you know, they've got their goo, they've got their sonic blast. Nothing you can do about that, but try not to be in front of them when they launch those bombs. And uh, you're going to be much better off about that. Okay, guys, one more thing. Let's talk about capturing these guys, because there is a mission in the main storyline where you need to capture one if you're going to use the Phoenix Point ending. So if your object is to capture one of these things, I still would really highly recommend that you start out with the virus rifles and just put it into that panic cascade. Because like I said, whether you're trying to capture it or kill it, once this thing's in that panic loop, it's not a threat to you anymore and you can do what you want to it. And you're going to need time to bring these guys down with the normal paralyzing weapons because they do so little damage and you have to chew through so much endurance to get them, right? Uh, you know, especially like these guys back here. Boy, if you're up against like this Therios, that's 4,800, 480 paralyzation damage you, you need to do. And if you're not familiar, uh, the endurance of these things, which is how much paralyzation they can take before they're fully paralyzed, is just their maximum hit points divided by 10. So 4,800 hit points maximum means that 480 paralyzation damage needs to be done to them. Um, again, with the paralyzing weapons, mind the armor, uh, because the Hera, it's only good, again, it's no good against 40 armor or more. The Athena rifle, the sniper rifle, para penetrates 70, anything less than 70 armor, so it's no good against 70 or better. And then your Neerazer, the hand-to-hand the -hand one, is uh, good against anything up to 50, so 49 or less, it'll penetrate, so... Uh, if you can get an Espita, that's another option. Each one of its attacks uh, paralyzes 40 damage. I don't know what the penetration is on that, though. I'd have to, I, I haven't looked it up. I don't know if I would recommend an Espita against these things because it's quick, but it's a big target and it's not particularly solid. It's only got about 600 health. And so if it's getting blasted and hit by other Pandorans and stuff like that, it's not the sturdiest vehicle and you might not be able to get your mileage out of it. It's an option. If you want to use that, you can, but I, I think you're better off with the virus loop, you know, the virus panic loop, and then just hit it with hand weapons and just, just hose it down with hand weapons for a few turns until it's paralyzed. The other thing that I usually suggest when you're talking about paralyzing things is disabling body parts to make it easier to paralyze so that you don't have to do quite as much paralyzation damage. And you can do that in this case too. Right. If we look at these guys, the, the problem with it is they have so much health on all of these body parts that it, it's a chore to take out any of the body parts. Even I mean, even the head. Look, I mean, the head is still, you know, 900 with 40 armor. If you take out the head, it's going to be minus 200 max health. That's only 20. That's only 20 paralyzation damage. You're saving yourself, you know, the torso honestly, is probably your best bet for uh, maximizing endurance lost, you know, versus how much is bleeding. But even here, you're looking at 1500 health to chew through and you'll get, you know, that'll save you 100 paralyzation damage. But how long is it going to take you to chew through 1500 health with 50 armor? Right. So you have to kind of balance that. Normally, I don't think you're going to need to do this. If you just use the virus rifles against these guys and you get them you get them into that panic loop, you're not going to have to worry about this probably, but it's there. It's an option, right? If you want to use it, you can, you can disable that. The carapace usually isn't too terribly bad other than its armor. Let me see if I can get on here. 
So you'd be, I don't know, that one's already damaged. Let's look at one that's not damaged. So you're looking at a thousand health to chew through here. It's going to save you 40 paralyzation damage. I, I, you know, again, I think it's going to take you longer to chew up that, uh, chew up that carapace than it is to just do 40 extra paralyzation damage to this thing. So I don't really know if you're gaining anything with that or not, but the option is there. What you do want to be super careful of though, is how much you're getting this thing bleeding because by the time, you know, you take off, you know, a thousand off its health for that or a 1500 off the torso for that, you know, you're going to be bleeding a hundred per turn. And so, plus you're going to lose some cracking its armor probably in other places as well. So you're going to have to be careful that you're not bleeding it out if you're taking out its body parts. There is a way to stop it from bleeding if you need to. And that is if you've researched the Vita grenade, which is the healing grenade. The Vita grenade, I, it doesn't discriminate. It just heals everything in the area. So what you can actually do if it's bleeding too much and you need to capture it, you can hit it with a Vita grenade and that'll stop the bleeding. And then you're then you're good to go again. You do still have to be careful where you hit it next because it can potentially uh, still start bleeding again if you disable another part. But, uh, you know, at least you can get the bleeding stopped if you have to. OK, guys. And so that I think is going to be just about it for this guide. Uh, these guys, as nasty as they are, are reasonably straightforward. They don't have a lot of trickery like, say, the Acherons do. Um, they have some abilities that you're not going to be able to avoid. Uh, goo repeller boots. Definitely, definitely encourage those against these guys, at least the ones that can spit goo. Definitely encourage blast vests against these guys, especially the ones that can, you know, fire the, the bombs. Obviously, a blast vest is not going to do you any good against the claws, but uh, generally speaking, those are good pieces of equipment to have anyway. The psychic, hit, the, the sonic scream head, nothing you can do about that. You're just going to lose that battle. Just like I said, spread your guys out horizontally relative to the Scylla. Make sure you're not getting more than one or two guys caught in that cone. Yeah, just bring out the virus rifles, man. That's that's your best bet. Get them, get them down, even, even the ones in the back that have the virus resistance. It's just going to take a little bit more to do it, but they'll they'll go down just the same as the front ones do with, without the resistance. It's just a matter of how much virus damage you have to put on them to get them there. But it's still going to be a much shorter path than trying to kill one outright. So... Definitely, definitely would encourage you to be equipping virus rifles on at least some of your soldiers, just in general, probably, uh, because, you know, it, depending on what level you're playing on your campaign, these guys can show up mid game, even just in I've had one show up in a haven, just he was there, you know, here he is. And it wasn't anywhere near the end. It wasn't near a citadel. He was just there in the haven. And so they're they're going to be in there and you're going to have to deal with them so yeah a couple of your guys carrying virus rifles just in case isn't a terrible idea if you don't have a priest obviously if you have a priest then you're better off yet uh, but um just make sure that you have that and it's always also a good idea to be able to break heavy armor and so that's another thing that's a good member of your team to have would be a berserker cross class something else maybe that's carrying some explosives so that they can use that armor break plus grenades and just just start shattering armor on different body parts that works really well so fires fires effective against them if you're equipped to put it out there that's kind of a more specialized case uh, a lot of the time though so maybe that's not as useful for you but anyway that's about it they're like i said pretty straightforward uh, just a lot of hit points to chew through but if you can get them in that panic loop you're good to go so uh, if you've enjoyed this video, do me a big favor, hit that like button. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing to my channel. That really, really helps me out a whole bunch. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.